Send available cars to the area. Suspect is wanted in a murder investigation. Hey guys, Pete here. This is my Mayor of Easttown ending explained video. We got a big twist, which means I guessed wrong about a lot of things. And we pretty much got answers to everything. All the major stuff anyway. No crucial questions left unanswered, but a little bit of lingering mystery. I'll break down everything that happened, what the ending means, and at the end of the video I'll talk about what worked for me and what didn't. Really quick spoiler warning, if you haven't watched the entire Mayor of Easttown limited series, all seven episodes, then this video won't be for you. And with that out of the way, let's jump right into it. With about 10 minutes remaining in the finale of Mayor of Easttown, her therapist reminds Mayor that she throws herself into cases as a way of delaying her own grief about what happened to her son, Kevin. That's followed by the question, do you think you're ready now to face what you're avoiding? I'll circle back around to explain the setup for how we got there, but this is the core of what drives the series. It's got a main character who peaked early, finds herself in a position of relative small town power. She's not just a cop, but a detective who's also kind of stuck where she's at, and she can't confront her grief. And it's real, to be sure, her son struggles with mental illness, drug addiction, and his eventual suicide. It's a lot to carry when you can't forgive yourself. Mayor's inability to move past it is understandable. And at the same time, we see how not confronting that grief affects her life and everyone around her. The big question is whether or not she can confront her past and move on. We start out with answers about what Jess and Dylan were up to. It turns out that burning the journals was Jess's idea. She was trying to keep Aaron's secret about DJ's real father from coming out, and in her own words, she was just trying to honor her friend. Dylan went along with this because he cared for DJ, but also knew that his parents wanted to continue to raise the child, and that it would break their hearts if he was taken away from them. Jess changed her mind, and we learned that the photo she gave to the chief as proof is a shot Erin took of herself in bed with her cousin John Ross, who's next to her asleep. This is confirmation that John was the father, and the chief confirms the motivations for why Jess and Dylan did what they did. This concludes the Jess and Dylan story, except for a scene later that confirms Dylan's feelings for DJ. He visits Lori's house after hearing about the surgery and gives her money he'd been saving, including the envelope he found in Aaron's room. At the river, we see that John is struggling with his plan to kill his brother. Billy had agreed to confess to Aaron's murder, but John doesn't think that he can trust him to hold up under questioning. At this point, it's hard to figure out why Billy would go along with it in the first place. Billy understood that he brought the gun and suspected that he might be trying to kill him, and when he learns that that is John's plan, he encourages him to do it, that he'd be doing him a favor. And we get the idea that John convinced his brother by telling him that he had a family to look after while Billy had no one. He can't go through with it, though, and when Mayor arrives, he turns the gun on himself. Billy jumps on him, stops him from taking his own life, and as Mayor's cuffing him, John begs Mayor to just end his life rather than taking him in. There's no need to look too closely at what John confessed to about the night of the murder since we know that he wasn't telling the truth. He does confirm that their relationship, and I say that with heavy air quotes, started at the reunion. He is remorseless about that and goes on to tell them how he justified what he was doing, saying that it was more than sex and that they had a connection and they could confide in each other and blah blah blah. The kind of things you would expect someone like that to say if they found themselves in that kind of situation. The other important thing that comes out of this is that Mare asks if Lori knew and he says that he convinced her to lie to her for him to tell her it was Billy that killed Aaron. Later, we see John being arraigned, and he has a moment to talk to his wife outside the courtroom. He asks her to take DJ in and raise him. She doesn't say anything here, but does end up taking this on later. And after he leaves, we see her and Mare exchange a tense look. When she comes home, Helen asks if she talked to Lori. And we learn that Mare's pissed off that she obstructed the investigation. And at this point, the tension comes from her thinking it was all to protect John. She has a heart-to-heart -heart with Siobhan about going to Berkeley, 
At first, she just says it's her life. She can do what she wants. But then when she's pressed, she tells her she thinks she should go. They have a moment here, and that pretty much wraps up the Siobhan story. But we do see her leave towards the end of the episode and how hard it is for everyone to say goodbye. After John's arrest, time moves on, and several of the other plot points are wrapped up. We see that Dawn and Beth helped Katie and Kenzie by giving them Freddy's house. I guess that makes more sense than his family moving back in where he died. We see that Lori finally gets poor little DJ his ear surgery, and in the process, see that the DJ stands for Dylan John. The custody dispute over Drew comes to an end when Carrie relapses. Mare and Frank are waiting at the mediators whenever she gets a call. Mare has a conversation with her as she's getting ready to leave for the treatment facility. Things start to unravel with the case when the family are all out together with Frank and Faye. Helen asks Frank if he's talked to John. He says that he hasn't and he talks about how he can't believe John did what he did and he still took them home acting like nothing happened on the night that Aaron died. There's one of those family generational moments when we see Helen, Mare, and Siobhan talking. Helen breaks down crying after they talk about Mare's childhood and how she took out a lot of her own frustrations on her daughter. Mare's noticeably uncomfortable, but says that she forgives her, and Helen says that's what she really wants for Mare, to be able to forgive herself about Kevin, because it wasn't her fault. That's one of those truths that you can think, that you can hear someone else say, that you can intellectually know is true, but accepting it is a whole different ballgame. And this is a major point that the show's trying to make. Mare may know this, but she hasn't been able to forgive herself. She goes to the bathroom and runs into Sandra. In their conversation, she learns that John wasn't actually having an affair with her this time. And that makes her think more about John's story. So we see her go back and start watching the tape, listening to him talk about not being able to remember what kind of gun Aaron had. While she's doing that, we learn about Billy Ross's fate when the chief comes and tells her that because he cooperated, he'll be eligible for parole the next year. Frank is able to move on. He repaired his relationship with Faye and everyone attended their wedding. And there is a conclusion to Richard's storyline. We see that Mare and him get together. Things look pretty good, but he had already accepted a different job. So he's going away for a one-year contract. And in the end, he was just a nice guy that came to town and fell for Mare. I suppose his leaving is essential in Mare's journey. She needs to move on. And the way it's set up, he's not a necessary ingredient in that recipe. The big reveal, the big ending comes by the way of us going back to where we started. Mare's in bed, and she gets a call from Betty Carroll's number, and that's odd because Betty's now dead. Of course, it's her husband, Glenn, and luckily, his Eagles mug from the championship game and that really nice pizza cutter he had went missing. Also, something strange happened with his gun, and when Mare hears it was a Colt detective special that went missing briefly but then returned, she wants to go see it. As she's looking at it, he tells her the other thing that's crazy. It was missing two rounds when it reappeared. And when she hears that, she wants to know who has access to the shed. And it's a short list of suspects. Just Glenn himself and the kid who cuts his grass, who turns out to be Ryan Ross. That revelation brings us back to Glenn's security camera, which showed up in the first episode and continued to pop up throughout the series. She checks the footage. She's able to see Ryan sneaking into the shed on the night of Aaron's murder. There's a really nice touch here where she makes an audible gasp when she understands what she's seeing, putting the pieces together that her best friend's son is involved with the death of his teenage cousin, a single mom who herself is the victim of sexual abuse at the hands of a trusted family member. She goes to his school and when he sees her, he flees and that prompts her to go back to her car and call it in. And we see that this crushes her. She drives to their house where Ryan's already told Lori that Mare's coming and everything the Ross family did was to protect Ryan. And now that Mare's figured it out, the truth is going to come out. It's a devastating situation. These are Mare's people. She's close with the entire family and it's her job to expose this teenager who made a crushing mistake and deliver justice for Aaron. 
At the station, Ryan gives a full confession explaining what really happened on the night Aaron died. He found out about their relationship, again with the big air quotes, when he found text messages on his dad's phone. He told him that he would keep that secret if he ended the relationship. The night of Frank's party, he saw that it was still going on, and when he found a message on the phone that Aaron wanted to meet him at the park at midnight, Ryan answered, saying he'd be there pretending to be John. When the adults went to the bar, Ryan went home, he got his bike, he stopped on the way to the park at the Carrolls to grab the gun, which he knew was there because of his grass cutting job. He says he just wanted to scare her, and that's obviously the truth. He didn't go there with the intention to kill her. Being a kid, he pointed the gun, though. He had his finger on the trigger. He shouted at her to stay away from his family. How could you do this? And tragically, she tried to take it away from him. They fought over it. It went off. And when he regained control, he hit her with the fatal shot in the face. He hid the body and called his dad. Later, John came home and told him it was all taken care of now and it was a secret. He made the strange choice of putting the gun back because he didn't know what else to do. He just thought that someone might find it if he threw it somewhere, and maybe if he put it back, no one would ever notice that it was gone. And he had no idea that when he was there the first time, Glenn heard him, went out to grab the gun for protection as he does, and wasn't able to find it. In the interview, they asked Lori if she knew. She admits that John came to her to tell her that she had to lie to Mare about it being Billy that morning before Mare arrived. We saw that conversation, we just didn't see all of it. She says that she would have taken this to her grave if Mare wouldn't have come to arrest Ryan, and she's obviously telling the truth here. Lori found herself in an impossible situation and chose to try to protect her son, which makes her decision something you can understand. When asked if he has anything else to say, Ryan just says that he's sorry, and they send him off to the juvenile facility. Outside, Mare goes to Lori and tries to comfort her, and she just feels betrayed and doesn't want anything to do with it. She's lost everything, and she blames Mare for solving the case. She says, you already had John, why couldn't you just leave it alone? It's Ryan, my Ryan, it was an accident, he doesn't even know how to hold a gun. My whole family's gone because of you, get away from me, I don't ever want to see you again. This reminds you of the earlier conversation they had on the bench, where Lori says Mare's pushing everyone away, but when asked, she says, no, it won't work on me because I won't let you. Now Lori is pushing her away and won't let Mare be in her life. And through clearer eyes, Mare can see that she really lost everything because of what her husband did. It's a tragic situation which all stems from John's criminal actions where everyone around him loses. The lives of two young people are lost. One is dead and one is in prison. Given the small town dynamic, Lori is poised to become the town pariah. Her presence is a reminder of what her husband did, what her son did, and everything that goes along with that. And people will know she tried to cover it up. For the ending, the show decides to shift away from that and focus on the bond between friends that have a connection in their tremendous loss. There's one last therapy session. When Lori comes up, she says she's called and sent messages, but they've gone unanswered. There's a seed planted here, and we come back full circle to the question I opened the video with. Do you think you're ready now to face what you're avoiding? Another seed is planted when Deacon Mark gives a sermon talking about community and how he feels things are turning around in East Town. He mentions that some people haven't emerged with everyone else, and they find themselves on the outside. He says it's not for us to decide if they're deserving. Our job is only to love. This triggers Mare to go to her best friend, and we see their heartfelt reunion at Lori's house. It's heavy and powerful, and is hands down the most gripping scene in a series that's had a lot of them. It opens the door for the closing sequence where Mare is sleeping with Drew in his bed. We see her walk into the hallway, open up the attic, and the series ends as she's finally able to return to the place where the paramedics had to wrestle her dead son's body from her arms. In the end, Mare is able to confront what's been hanging over her for years. And as she told Mr. Carroll, that pain will probably never go away, but at least where she's at now, you can imagine things might get better. As a series, overall it was a lot of fun to engage with the whodunit side of things. I had a blast breaking down the episodes, looking for clues, trying to solve it, and reading everyone's theories. Plot-wise, it mostly worked. 
As you know from watching my other videos, I was a skeptic about the Ryan theory, but technically speaking, they made it work. The breadcrumbs were there along the way. Everything falls into place when you find out he's the killer. You can see how it played out and the character's motivations and actions after the fact make sense based on the situation. Obviously, in a mystery, you have to have misdirection, red herrings, and twists. And there seemed to be a decision to portray scenes in a way that you could draw multiple conclusions, which can really add to that when it works. I think related to the plot, there are some of these that they didn't quite pull off, like John exhibiting grooming behavior with Ryan and Dylan pointing the gun in Jess's face. Some of those things seem misleading after the fact, but they're not unforgivable. I appreciated the attempts to lighten things up through humor and a wonderful performance from Gene Smart. The performances really are what stands out by the end. As much as some of this finale didn't work for me, the individual character moments all worked and were moving when you look at them on their own. And a lot of that comes back to the performances and the choices in direction. Julianne Nicholson essentially collapsing, going limp in Kate Winslet's arms is something that will be burned in my brain from this point forward. I think where the finale came up short for me is something that worked really well in the early episodes. The quick pace of moving from one thing to the next, adding layers to the mystery without ever having to slow down to hit the character moments. They nailed a balance of both elements which is difficult to do. In the final episode, it didn't work nearly as well for me. And the character side of things suffered as the big show pieces didn't hit as hard as I would have expected them to. After John's arrested at the beginning of the episode, there's an expectation of a twist coming, and that takes up a lot of space. I think this stood out the most when they had that scene when they were out to eat with Frank and Faye. There's this important family moment between Helen and Mare, and it does work in that instant, but it almost feels out of place because there's so much other stuff going on. You experience it, and then you instantly move on to what's going on with this case that isn't quite making sense. Mare was a great vehicle for a talented actor to show off her stuff in a different kind of role. And Kate Winslet did a terrific job. Julianne Nicholson gave her a run for her money in the finale, and it was a hell of a cast across the board. If you just focus on Mare's story, and that does seem to be what everything else is there to serve, it was an interesting character study. And you wouldn't be wrong for enjoying that. I found that it took me out of things and made this a little hard to do because of the writing decision to have Mare break into the evidence room and steal evidence and plan it on Carrie. You have this small town where things are not great. You're touching on a lot of difficult issues. The opioid crisis is a big part of that. And really, no one is making it out of this. So to me, it seems like maybe don't make the character that has a little bit of power a cop who abuses that to punch down and then suffers no consequences. Mare didn't lose anything in that. There was really no self-reflection on it. She still got the kid. Carrie still relapsed. And that took away from the character for me. I mean, she went to therapy. And sure, that worked out for her. But they could have found a different way to get her there. I think it was a smart decision to shift the focus on how solving the case affected Mare personally, considering that a lot of people did figure out the twist on the murder ahead of time. But I think the ending would have had a lot more impact for me if she hadn't planted the heroin. It was a fun ride though, and I enjoyed interacting with you, so let me know in the comments what did you think of the finale, what did you think about the series overall, and what's on your mind now that it's over. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I'm not sure what I'll be covering next. I've been looking around. If there's something you're looking forward to, let me know about that in the comments too. And thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.